Alhamdulillah. So we're going to continue on in our discussion about the hurdles on the path to Allah. And it's very important for us to remember the first hurdle that we've been talking about. The first main hurdle on the path to Allah is the hurdle of knowledge, the hurdle of knowledge. And so if we are able to learn sincere knowledge, then from there, our main goal needs to be to repent to Allah and to try and achieve a state of sincere repentance by means of which we can purify our heart, we can get, we can ask Allah to forgive and pardon and cleanse the sins that we have committed, and that will then allow us to travel the path more seriously. Now, it's important to remember a few things. Again, for those who, that, who have not joined before, we are covering the book uh, by Imam Ghazali, which is essentially the path, hurdles on the path to Allah. Um, we have talked about the first main hurdle, which is to learn beneficial and sacred knowledge, and now the second hurdle that someone is going to face after they have uh, tried to learn proper knowledge is to repent to Allah. And the uh, importance of repentance is because once somebody starts the path and they actively start to be inspired to get closer to Allah, you realize how many sins you've committed. We realize how many sins we've committed, how many mistakes we've made, and we have a desire and a yearning to try and get rid of those sins. And so then we go about the process of asking Allah for sincere forgiveness, for sincere forgiveness for our sins. So there's a couple of things that um, we want to try and do, uh, that we want to try and do here, inshallah. The first is we have to reflect on what what have we actually done in our life that's haram. When someone makes the decision that they want to tread the path to Allah, the sincere path of spirituality, the path of trying to draw near, we must reflect on, okay, what have we done that is haram in our life? What have we done that's wrong? What have we done that we actually need to seek repentance for? And that should put in us a deep urge, an urge to want to really, really deeply repent to our Lord. And that urge should come from within, and it's something that Allah will inspire in somebody. And then it allows for that person to turn to Allah in a, in a completely sincere way, where we ask Allah, Ya Allah, I'm sorry for what I've done. You feel remorse. You feel guilt. You feel that uh, almost ashamed before Allah for all the sins and the wrong life that we've lived. And then someone turns their life towards Allah. Toba, which is what repentance is. Uh, the word for repentance in Arabic is Toba. That's what this, the, the Prophet ﷺ said and talked about Toba often. Allah talks about Toba as a quality he loves. He says in the Quran, Allah, you hate the Tawabin, we hate the Mutahirin. Allah loves the people of Toba and he loves the people. Of, uh, who are trying to purify themselves. So turning, Toba is to turn to Allah. It's to turn, literally. So you you and I may have been living a life where we've been away from Allah, and Toba now is to turn back to Him. And Toba is, a, there's a one-time Toba, and then there is a continual Toba. The, the major Toba we make in our life, ideally, is that time where we say, okay, I'm going to leave this life of sin and jahiliyyah, and wrongs that I've been doing, and I'm going to turn towards Allah sincerely. And then there's a daily toba where someone says, I made a lot of mistakes today and I'm going to repent to Allah. And then someone might reflect on this weekly and once a year and so on and so forth. So it's important then to realize how to go about repenting, how to go about repenting. If someone has not sincerely repented, the shackles of sin will always prevent them from spiritual progress. Sins weigh you down, good deeds lift you up. Good deeds are going up towards heaven, and heaven has an angelic and magnetic pull towards heaven. And sins are going down towards hell, and it's pulling you down. And so you can think about it metaphorically that the more good deeds you do, the more inclined you are to follow your spiritual nature. And the more sins that you do, without seeking repentance for those sins, the more inclined someone is going to be to follow their lower nature, their carnal appetites, their carnal desires. And so that's why repentance, though, it will cleanse the sin. And it gets to a point where somebody may have committed immense sins, immense sins, and then they get to a point where they repent for those sins, Allah allows them to transform their life, and they turn their life around, and then Allah says in the Quran, that he gives them good deeds for all of the wrong that they may have done. That he actually turns those sins into good deeds. That's how important repentance is. Because Allah loves the 
people who are turning back to him. It's not that sin is, uh, that we're never going to sin. We know we're going to sin. Sin is going to happen. Allah knows that we're going to sin. In fact, it comes to one narration that if, um, if we didn't make mistakes, Allah would create a create Allah would create people in our in our place who would make mistakes and turn back to Him, because it is part of the nature of the human being to forget and to make mistakes, and it's part of the nature of our Lord to forgive us. Alhamdulillah, and that we have a forgiveness that we have a forgiving Lord. So we're going to talk about um, why uh, how to go about the process of repentance. But first, let's talk about the reality of sin. You have different types of sin in our religion. You have different types of sin in our religion and in our um, the spiritual tradition. The first type of sin is a sin that is, this is a sin, excuse me, which would be considered a major sin. And this will create a major amount of darkness in the heart for somebody, a major amount of spiritual darkness in the heart for somebody. And then from there, you have categories of sins. You have major sins, and you'll have um, that less significant, and then you'll have minor sins, and then you'll have mistakes, and then the categories continue to go up until somebody may repent from wasting time, and someone else may repent from not doing enough good deeds. And so the categories of repentance vary depending on how far along someone is on their spiritual path. But when it comes to the major sins, they will completely shackle someone from spiritual progress, meaning you and I will be trying to progress and then we'll get caught up in a major sin. The darkness of that sin, so it's important to understand the reality of sin and the reality of the darkness that enters you when you commit a sin. And then there's categories of sins and we have to know what these categories are because sometimes as Muslims, people focus on a small, a minor sin, but we're still engrossed in the major sin. No, you have to focus on prioritization here. Get rid of the major sins first, then focus on the minor sins, then focus on what's makru, and so on and so forth, which is dislike. So among the major sins, there's various major sins, which you have, of course, the sin of associating partners with Allah, where someone actually believes that something has power other than Allah, absolute power, or is associated in power other than Allah. No one really these days, or the vast majority of Muslims are not committing that, um, the vast majority of people are not really committing that. Uh, there's of course the sin of kufr before this, which is um, that someone is not in Islam, and then they would admit that they would accept Islam, and then they would essentially convert, right? And then you have the sin of shirk. But then there's a lot of major sins in addition to that, right? You have the sin of murder, the sin of drinking alcohol, the sin of gambling, the sin of intoxicants, the sin of doing drugs, the sin of um, uh, that actually being disrespectful to your parents is considered a major sin, the sin of interest interest loans, auto loans, student loans, um, many home loans. These are many of these sins are considered um, big, big sins. Probably the most ignored sin in the Western world for Muslims is riba, is interest, and we'll talk about that at some point as well. Um, and so there's a, there's, there's a category then of major sins, and you have major sins that you can do with your hands, you have major sins you could do with your tongue, you have major sins that you could do with your eyes, you have major sins um, that you could do with your private parts, such as zina and adultery, um, you have major sins you could do with your other other various other limbs. So the goal of the believer then, the first step is to think about, okay, all of the major sins that we might have done or that we are still engrossed in. And then we make a sincere effort to try and repent to Allah, to really sincerely try and repent to Allah for those major sins. And we have to understand the darkness that's going to come into the heart. But the Prophet ﷺ tells us about the reality of sinning. Sometimes we think that sinning... Um, will only affect us in the, in the next life. It couldn't be farther from the truth. That sinning will affect us in this life and it will affect us in the next life. In this life, the way sinning will affect us is that it will result in a darkness in the heart. It will result in depression. It will result in anxiety. It will result in worries. It will result in potential tribulation and problems and a loss of blessing in your life. And many things happen, but they don't happen that day. They don't necessarily happen that day. And so um, you have to keep this in mind when it comes to when it comes to, to singing. So the Prophet ﷺ told us that when someone lies, when a servant tells a lie, he said that two, the angels will recoil, will recoil from the stench that comes out of this person's mouth, from the stench that comes out of that person's mouth. So literally, the sin of lying results in a, a scent for the angels, in a bad smell, basically, that will repel the angels away from that person. All these sins, they have realities. They have realities. And why 
when we wake up to the reality of these sins, we will then start to realize why we need to change because we are steeped in major sin, many of us. We are steeped in major sin. Um, the amount of uh, the problems we have in our life most of the time are coming because of our own mistakes, because of our own mistakes. And we don't believe in our religion. We do not believe in that in our religion that um, you know someone died for our sins or something like that. But that's not that's not really a logical concept either. Uh, because how is it that that somebody uh, does not have to work hard to actually ask Allah for forgiveness for their own sin? Um, so you have to you have to seek you have to earn to a degree, right? Um, what it is that you are going to to receive from Allah. So that's that's the 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 important first important aspect here is to know the shackles that sin puts you in the shackle the the way it weighs you down and how much it weighs you down and how much how many problems you're going to have when these sins are weighing you down when these sins are weighing you down so that's the first part Alhamdulillah. then it's about saying okay now i want to change my life so how am i going to leave these sins and move on towards something that is um that is positive that is positive and if somebody is unable to do good deeds, if someone is unable to do good deeds, it's usually, according to many of the scholars, because the shackles of their sins are still weighing them down. The shackles of our sins are still weighing us down, and so as a result, we are unable to, to actually engage in good works. We are unable to wake up for the morning prayer. We are unable to pray on time. It's because the more someone sins, the more darkness that comes, the more laziness that develops, and the more sloth that someone develops, and then slowly and slowly and slowly, they start to veer from the spiritual path. The more good someone does, the more spiritual light that they get, the more spiritual light that they get, the more spiritual light that they get, and then it becomes easier to do more good deeds. Allah talks about this in the, uh, in the Quran. So that it's recognizing the sins that you and I have done. The next thing is, okay, how do we figure out what is sincere repentance. How do we figure out what is sincere repentance? Sincere repentance is to recognize and to deeply ask Allah for forgiveness and to make an intention to never return to that sin. Never return to that sin. What, how, do, how exactly do we realize that? And you have to know that you may slip up at some point in life and back to that sin. But that day when you repent, you have to say, Ya Allah, I'm not going to go back. I'm sorry for this mistake that I made. I am sorry for this wrong that I've been doing. I'm sorry for disobeying you. I'm sorry for disappointing you. That is the first part of uh, major sin. That is, sorry, that is the first part of sincere repentance. First part of sincere repentance. And I see that people have um, questions. Uh, we, we have this class on Wednesdays. We answer questions during the question breaks. The questions are not answered um, because there's other uh, attendees. The questions are not answered until the, uh, the breaks. So. Uh, just please bear with us, and we'll get to the to the questions. Um, and yes, I will. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so, sincere repentance. What is sincere repentance? You first recognize the wrong that you've done and you feel a sincere remorse to your, to your Lord. That, ya Allah, I'm really, really sorry for this haram that I've done. I'm really sorry for the mistake that I've made. The, re the remorse and the guilt you feel in and of itself is already a way of repenting to Allah. That's already a really, really, really important part of repenting to Allah is feeling that remorse, is feeling that, that remorse. The second step, in, and we're summarizing here, then we'll get into the detail. The second step is that you ask Allah, you verbalize your forgiveness. You ask Allah and you say, Ya Allah, please forgive me for this wrong that I've done. And you may pray to rakat to him. You may have a moment of time where you cry to him and where you sincerely beg him for forgiveness. The goal is for the sincerity to penetrate the depths of your heart. To penetrate the depths of your heart such that that you feel so bad that you turn to Allah and you ask him to forgive you and you ask him to never make you go back to that sin. That is, again, amongst the essence of repentance. So you feel bad about it in the first place, the guilt comes. 
Now you actively engage in what's called Tawbah, making Tawbah. You may sit and you may say Astaghfirullah some number of times, for the Prophet ﷺ told us to make Istighfar at least 70 times a day. And some of the scholars recommend a lot more than that for us um, because we uh, get, get, um, commit many more sins than the, than the companions did, obviously. And then, then you beg Allah to forgive you for the specific sin that you're repenting for and then for all the sins you and I might have committed. So let's say there's someone gets caught up in zina and they feel extremely bad about that in, in, in engaging in an impermissible relationship. And then they sincerely turn to Allah and ask him for forgiveness for that. Inshallah, if you make a sincere repentance for doing something wrong and you feel bad about it and you ask Allah for forgiveness, and then you make the, and we'll talk about the final one, which is to intend to never do that thing again. Inshallah, that's a sign of accepted repentance. That means that you fulfill the qualifications of repentance, and, but that it must come from within. It must come from within. It's sincerity is of the utmost importance in our religion. Um, that we have to do things with what's called ikhlas, with sincerity, because it's linked to purity. And when you do things with sincerity, Allah, inshallah, will accept it. But when you do things with, you're trying to like say, oh, I'm just uh, asking Allah for this, but you don't really, you don't sincerely actually want to repent him. You know you're going to go back to commit that sin again tomorrow. Obviously, you're not going to know the trick Allah because Allah says um, that in the, uh, uh, Allah knows that that is sulul, the whisperings of the heart. Allah knows what your heart is thinking. Allah knows what your heart is thinking. So, um, we will uh, first pause here to see what questions uh, there are. Uh, and then we'll go on. So a few questions coming in online. Okay. Okay, so can repentance be done in English? Yes, repentance not only can, but should be done in your primary language. So if your primary language is English, in English. If it's Spanish, it should be Spanish. If it's Arabic, it should be Arabic. If it's Urdu, it should be Urdu. If it's Turkish, it should be Turkish. Repentance does not need to be done in Arabic. The only thing that's really required in our religion for you to do in Arabic is the formal ritual prayer, is the formal salat that you do. And of course, the recitation of the Quran when you're reciting it, then you will um, uh, do so. With, 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 uh, in, in Arabic, but otherwise when you are repenting to Allah, you can repent and you should repent in a language that you are going to actually understand, that you are going to actually understand. So um, it again, sincerity is the key here. Remember, Allah is the creator of all languages. Allah is the creator of all languages and the creator of all people. He's the creator of diversity. He's the creator of different thoughts um, and different types of thoughts. So it's not you know beyond Allah to understand different, different ways of communicating, obviously. So, so you should repent and feel bad, of course, in your um, own language. Yeah. Um, do you have to mention the sin in the Toba or if it's in your heart, it's okay. So because Allah knows the thoughts of your heart, you don't have to verbally mention something. But for you to actualize the state is the most important. So when you are doing any form of bicker or repentance, the goal is to actualize the reality of what you are doing. It's not to... Uh, that simply say it, right? That's not the goal. The goal is to, to live the reality of it. And the reality of it will come when it goes into the depths of your heart. And that reality really comes when you are sincere. And so it does not have to be verbalized. Allah knows your thoughts and you can have questions or you can rather have um, that ways of um, speaking to Allah where you don't even verbalize something, but that, he, that you are still making dua to him. Okay. Um, couple other questions that have come in and then we'll continue, inshallah. Okay, what about missed prayers because of sleeping and prayed after? So you should still repent from missed prayers and then you pray when you wake up, but you have to get to a point where you identify the root cause of why you're missing a prayer continuously. If it's one off, like let's say once a year someone misses Fajr, okay, that's one thing that inshallah will be excused in the long run because you are sincere in most days. But if you're constantly missing Fajr or constantly missing a prayer because of sleep or something else, that means there's a sin that could be bogging you down that you're doing during the day that's preventing you 
from being up at this very auspicious and amazing time. Um, because you cannot simply just always sleep through it if something's not bogging you down. The, the, it's, it's, it's important to repent from it, but it should not be done continuously, that you should feel so bad, and at some point you should turn to Allah saying, Ya Allah, please, I'm so weak, I can't wake up, help me get up. But you have to make it a point to do everything in your power to try and get up. So there's one thing if someone is just negligent, and by negligence here, we mean someone who's like, hey, I'm not going to get up. I'm not going to try to do this anymore. Um, and they just sleep through. They set their alarm at like 9 a.m. or something like that. There's another thing if someone sets five alarms at 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.10, 6.15 a.m. And they're, they're trying to get up for Fajr. And they tell their family member, someone to wake them up as well. And they just can't wake up. The two are very different states. The second is trying. Allah just wants you to try. The first one is ignoring the command of Allah and is being arrogant with the command of Allah. And is just thinking it's all good. And they're in a very dangerous state. And so you have to try and you leave the result to Allah, but you have to try hard. And when it comes to missing prayers, specifically missing Fajr, you want to treat it as though if you had a flight that morning. If you had a flight really early, 5, 6 a.m., everybody would be up early. Very rarely would we miss the flight. But it's more important to pray a prayer on time than it is to catch a flight. So you have to think about the reality of that. Can um, Dua be done um, outside of your five prayers? Yes, dua can be done outside of your five prayers, and it should be done outside of your five prayers. Dua is not something that's constricted. So you have in Islam something called the time of prayer, and then you have something called the sunnah of kar of the Prophet ﷺ, meaning the sunnah dhikrs and remembrances that he would do at various times of the day when he would wake up in the morning, when he would use the restroom, when he would put clothes on, when he would leave the restroom, when he would um, go outside of the house, when he would go to the marketplace when he would um, like meet somebody. All of these, he would have du'as for. For example, he would say in the morning, Alhamdulillah, that all praise be due, to one, be due to the one who that resurrected us and gave us life after that we were in a state of like the mini sleep, or mini death, which is sleep. So, um, that these are du'as. And so it's important to do any du'a. You should ideally be in a state the, the true people of spirituality, when they get to them, we're talking about this, the, the hurdles on the path to Allah, as you cross these hurdles, the people of spirituality, they get to a point where they're always in a state of dua and they heard of Allah, regardless of the time of day. Okay. Yeah, we answered, you do not have to perform Salat al-Tawbah to make Tawbah, but you should ideally regularly pray to Raka'ah of forgiveness from Allah for all your sins, and ideally, at least the times when you're repenting from a major sin, you should offer, um, and we'll talk about specifics shortly, but Salat al toba as well as, um, I want to say, as well as um, that offering charity. You have been in a haram relationship, but then later repent. Does it take the barakah away from the relationship? It's a good question. Um, inshallah, if you repent, and both of you repent sincerely, and you pray to Allah to make you from the people of right guidance and the people of light, then inshallah, Allah will put the barakah back. But yes, the sin does take the barakah away initially. And so the repentance must be done sincerely. And you must rectify anything that you did while it was in the haram state. And you should try not to discuss the days of haram too often because that's not a day of sweetness really you want to talk about. Okay, so a couple other you have to do wudu to make dua. No, you do not you do not need you do not need to be in wudu or ghusl to do dua or dhikr other than recite Quran. That's it. That's for, for when you are in a state of um, holding the Quran. But otherwise you should do dua all the time and dhikr all the time. That's the goal. When you're walking outside, talk to God. Dua is a form of talking to Allah, a form of conversation. And um, it's important to not link dua only to prayer or only to a specific time of day when you are driving, walking, etc., this is a time to get away from heedlessness and listening to music and all these other things and instead have a conversation with Allah. Okay. Uh, we'll continue, inshallah. Okay, I want to know if you can play with our eyes closed. Let me know. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not... Um, if it's going to help you focus more, then you could with your eyes closed but otherwise you pray with your eyes open it just really depends in terms of your focus yeah. if you're in a haram relationship will you ever get a righteous spouse after repenting um 
Yeah, yes, inshallah, yes. If you sincerely repent, so it's important to know that um, sincere repentance washes you as though you were like newborn. It's completely clean. So we have people in our religion, the one story, one of the great, um, uh, the, one, one of the stories that's told in our religion of somebody who eventually became a great scholar, that he used to literally be um, what's called a highway robber, which is like a gang member at the time, where they would he would have a gang of people and they would literally just rob people on, as they were traveling. They would just like jump caravans and then rob them all. They take all their stuff and then they leave them to go. Um, and sometimes, uh, obviously, there's harm inflicted on the people when you're robbing them. And then, and, and he did this for a long period of time, until one day he made the decision that I'm going to turn to Allah. He made a sincere toba. He made a sincere repentance to Allah. And then he became a, he devoted his life to learning the deen. And he devoted his life to traveling the path of spirituality. And then he became one of the great scholars and the great people of, of uh, knowledge of Allah, of Ma'rifa in our religion. His name is Al-Fudayl ibn al hayyam and so there's many stories. There's stories of people who were prostitutes, women who were prostitutes, and then they sincerely repented to Allah and they became great worshippers and great scholars. Repentance can turn change someone from murderer to among the best people. But the repentance must be done. This is why it's so important to repent. Allah loves the people who turn back to him. Allah loves the people who turn back to him. There's a reason I wake up for Fajr without an alarm. Alhamdulillah, that's very good if you do. Um, are you humbly? Uh, no, I'm not humble. I'm happy. We love all the love that's in here. Um, okay. Okay, so question. Oh, can you still go to heaven if you are gay and you give in to it but have more good deeds than bad deeds? Okay. Um, Okay, so so this is very 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 important to um, for none of us to determine to you so so no human being, other than the Prophet can say who will go where. The Prophet could say this is the person of Jannah, this is the person of fire. The prophets have that maqam specific, specifically say Rasulullah and he could say this is the person who's going to be in the highest rank of Jannah and so on. But other than that, only Allah obviously, is going to be able to make that determination. So if somebody is struggling with the sin, okay, let's say in this case, you mentioned um, yeah, that, uh, um, that that you're homosexual and you are um, acting on it. And in the religion of Islam, we know that amongst the major sins, um, we listed them out, right? That, that uh, sexual promiscuity, heterosexual sexual promiscuity is haram. So is homosexual promiscuity. It's also haram. Anything outside of lawful marriage is haram. Okay, so that's one thing. At the same time, somebody may do a lot of bad deeds, and they may also do a, a, a good deeds. And the weighing is going to happen on the day of judgment. And so it's in no one's place to say this sin, other than the sin of shirk, that cannot be repented for, and to, uh, that, that rather, if someone doesn't repent before they die, right, they cannot be, they won't be forgiven for that. But other than that sin, it's not on anyone else to say that there's one sin, this one sin will never be forgiven. You don't know that. Because you are limiting the mercy of Allah. Allah ultimately starts his book by Ar-Rahman Ibrahim. Allah has over 99 names. He has many names we don't know, and at least a few hundred that he, a uh, hundred plus that he's told us. He could have said, Allah, Bismillah, that, that instead of the most merciful, the most compassionate, he could have said the most just, the vengeful. He could have said the destroyer and compeller. There's a lot of names he could have had. Jabad. He could have used a lot of these names. He didn't. He used Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Two merciful names. He could have also used one merciful name and one more intense name, but he didn't. He used names of mercy because he loves mercy. And he sent his prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he gave him the title of Rahmat al Alameen, mercy to all the worlds. He did not give, and this is in the Quran, he did not give the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the title of that, um, vengeance for all the world or the sword of all the worlds or all he could have said that but he said what mercy to all you are the rahmat alameen so mercy is the basis of islam okay this is important a lot of muslims have forgotten this recently especially some people who are um have gone toward extreme tendencies they've forgotten mercy entirely 
that someone does one wrong and they want to like hurt them and that's, that's not our way that's not the way of the muslim the the, the standard or rather the the uh common approach we should use one of mercy because that's what allah starts with allah begins with mercy he continues with mercy and he's going to end with mercy he says this on the day of judgment that allah will his mercy will ultimately outweigh his wrath it's important for all of us and guys we want this all of us have done a lot of wrong in life. This is also super more important to remember. We've all made a ton of mistakes. We've all sinned a lot. We've all said things that are incorrect. Incorrect. We've all argued with people. We've all been disrespectful to our parents. We might have engaged in taking interest loans. And so it's important for Muslims to not pick and choose sins to hurt people over, to hurt people over. And at the same time, that um, we are caught up in so many major sins and we, uh, that um, uh, want Allah's justice for some people and want Allah's mercy for us. How does that work? Allah says, be merciful to others and you'll see mercy from me on the day of judgment. So don't find one sin and say, no, for sure someone is going to hell. For sure someone is going to hell. And, um, and then, and then you, you and I think, oh, we're safe. We're going to have no, no, that's, that's not the, that's the way of the hypocrite. The way of the believer is to say, I'm, I'm in trouble and to assume other people are going to be okay. That's the way of the believer. This is the way of the Sahaba as well. They did not have some guarantee that, oh, we're gonna all be fine. So all of this to say that for the one who asked this question, you have to strive sincerely to try to turn to Allah. You may slip up on this path if you have a desire that is uncontrollable for you. You have to strive to turn back to him, to repent to him every time that desire gets a hold of you and to ultimately make the intention to try to leave that desire for Allah's sake, you have to try. If you don't succeed, at least you try. But if you don't try at all, your state is more perilous. Your state is even more worried. But you must try. Never leave this deen. Never let anyone tell you that because you are engaged in one specific type of sin, that you are not worthy of Allah's forgiveness. All of those people are more astray. They're, they're, they're in big trouble because they're doing what shaitan did. Shaitan is the only one who tells people they, they can't achieve forgiveness. He told Adam alayhi salam, he, he tells people they can't achieve forgiveness. But the Muslim, they give doors of mercy for people. So it's time for the Muslims to stop ignoring the vast majority of sins all of us are doing and to only pick on where the Muslims love to pick on sins that women do, they, uh, women are not dressed appropriately, and this, they love to do that. Um, but uh, they, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't like to focus on all the sins that the rest of us are doing. Okay. So we'll continue, inshallah. Is, someone said, um, is sound is off? Is it working now? Hopefully it's working. Okay, so we're going to continue um, with a few questions and then we're going to get back to the, the topic of repentance. So yeah, so for, for just you, for the one who asked the question, do not worry. You just rely on Allah's mercy, seek forgiveness, stay on the path, pray your prayers, recite Quran, do good, fast Ramadan, and Allah is a merciful Lord and try, try to not get caught up in that sin. Try to not get caught up in that sin. But there's a lot of us who are engaged in so much haram and we've gotten, you know, and, and so don't don't let anyone turn you away from the path. The doors of repentance are open. Can we buy a house living in the USA? It's almost impossible to avoid interest in buying a house. You can buy a house using what's called a halal mortgage. They use the, the contract principles of Mashakira and Madabara, and those are halal principles that they use. So you can use one of these lenders. Guidance Residential is one of them. There's another one um, called um, the name. But anyways, there's a few different ones. You can just search halal mortgages and you should buy a house there. Try not to go with a traditional lender. Yeah. But but student loans and car loans are not permissible for the Muslim to take. They're not permissible. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's get back to it, inshallah. So we're talking about repentance. And um, now, so this is for the one who wants to repent. They have to feel bad about the repentance. They have to feel bad about the sin then you and I have to get into a state where we are going to um, oh, sorry, Muhammad, sincerely ask Allah for forgiveness, then we make the intention to never turn to the sin. What about the person who doesn't even feel bad in the first place? That is the question for us, because many of us are steeped in sin, and we don't even feel bad about it. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we do? For the one who thinks, there's a few diseases here of the heart that are acting up. One is someone thinks, well, I'm going to live for a long period of time. I'll go to Hajj one day and I'll stop sinning then. But right now I don't want to have fun. That's one category of person. For that person, they need to reflect on death and they need to reflect on 
how quickly death can come to you and how easy it is to die when you are young. And I know a lot of people who are in their 20s, in their teens, uh, and they're, they, they've just passed away suddenly. There's people who pass away suddenly of heart attack, who get, can get cancer and then within one year they're gone. I just We just went to a janazah last week of, of somebody who uh, got diagnosed with cancer maybe 10 months ago, 11 months ago. And then he passed away and it was expected that he would live a bit longer and uh, maybe even a few months or a year longer. So you don't know when you're going to die, but you have one chance. Your day of judgment comes the day you die. That's your day of judgment. Why? Because you don't. Really, there's not really any other way for, for you to earn good deeds except for some sadhaka jariya um, that somebody um, might have given you, like a, like a, a continuous charity of some sort. But otherwise, that's it. And so we have. To, so for those of us who are delaying repenting because we are comfortable, Imam Ghazali, in this text that we're covering, he says, you need to reflect on the reality of death and how serious death is and think about the, important, the, the, the nearness of death. And the Prophet وسلم, he told us to, to reflect on death often. It's something Muslims don't do anymore because we don't have graveyards around us. We don't often go to the... the, the in, in, if you go to Medina, Manawara, they have um, the Masjid al Nabawi, And then about a five-minute walk within the same area of eye distance, you have what's called Jannat al-Baqi which is the graveyard where many of the blessed companions and the family of the Prophet وسلم, and many other great people are buried. Anyhow, the Prophet وسلم, would go there often to reflect on death and to teach the Ummah the importance of reflecting on death, to, to, to bury people, to do the Janazah prayer, and to just realize that you are going to go there one day. These days, what are Muslims? We go all the time to the mall, we go all the time to um, each other's houses, we go all the time to each other's houses. maybe we go once a year to a graveyard. That's not sufficient. That means death is not going to be remembered. And in societies we live in, they hide the graveyards in random, random, random places, in random parts of, of town, um, rather than making them front and center. In Muslim society, they would be part of society. The marketplace, there's a masjid, there's a school, and then there's a cemetery. I mean, it's all there. So you would reflect on death when you're walking to school. And you'd be like, I probably don't, I don't want to make a mistake today. Like, I don't want to get caught up because death is real. So... That's one of the first things to do. If you delay repentance, um, you have to remind yourself of death. The next one is for somebody who says, well, my sin really isn't that big of a deal. What's going to happen? Maybe I have to go, you know, this is a terrible thing to say, but maybe I go to hell for a little bit and then I'll be forgiven. And they just kind of ignore that. For that person, you have to reflect on the reality of Allah's punishment. So it's important for some of us to reflect on the reality of Allah's mercy. For others, it's important to reflect on the reality of Allah's punishment. Why is this? Because, guys, everybody is in their own um, spiritual state. and They have this specific medicine that they need each time. So you might have a medicine spiritually that you need today that won't apply in the same way to you a year from now. And that medicine might not be applicable to another person today. right? So if you and I are caught up in a specific sin, but we don't think it's a big deal, we have to reflect on the punishment of that sin. And reflect means really seriously reflect. I'll give you one example of a sin that many of us are in, but we don't reflect on the seriousness of it. And this is known as the sin of backbiting, of ghibat, of talking bad about people. What is backbiting defined as? Backbiting is defined as saying something about someone that were they to hear it, they wouldn't like it. If it's true, that's what backbiting is. So let's say you say someone is annoying. You've backbitten them. If you say someone is overweight, that most people wouldn't like to hear that. You, and you talk about it behind their back. We back with them. You, you and I say someone is um, that we question. Why did they do that? It's so weird. That's backbiting because they wouldn't like to hear that in front of them. Backbiting. The punishment of backbiting is that somebody has to eat um, in, in the next life the dead flesh of the person that they talk bad about. You literally, t and this is disgusting. I know, but you take their flesh. And it's going to be dead like a rotten corpse, and you have to eat it. And the tongues of people will be getting cut up because of the sin that they've done. And then they have to give their good deeds away to the person they talk bad about. You give their good, so you already don't like them, because you talk bad about them in this life, and you have to give your good deeds to them in the next life. And they take your good deeds, take your good deeds till you run out of good deeds. Then they give you their bad deeds, because you, they, we talk so much bad about them, that now they have a right to take our bad deeds. Or sorry, to take our good deeds and give us their bad deeds. So backbiting is very serious, but it's a sin that many of us, we just don't think much about. We come home, we might even be coming home from the mosque and talking bad about people at the mosque, oh, this guy did this, this guy did that. 
The Muslim doesn't do that. What did the Prophet say? He said, speak good, the believer, the one who believes in Allah in the last day should speak good or remain silent. Should speak good or remain silent. Don't talk all the time about people. Avoid it. This includes sports players. This includes um, that all sorts of people. Just don't, it's not our business what, what someone is doing. Don't talk about them all the time. It's not our business. The Muslims should mind their own business. We also heard hadith of the Prophet Islam, that we should mind our own, literally focus on yourself, mind your own business, as he, he said uh, something along those lines. So this is another example of a sin. So we might be immersed in certain sins, we might not even realize their sins. This is why we have to do an examination of the sins of the tongue, of the sins of the hand, of the sins of the feet, of the sins of the eyes, of the sins of the ears. Sins of the tongue will include backbiting, lying, cussing, saying the F word, saying the D, all the bad words that we might say. These are sins of the tongue, that, that being rude to people, being mean to people, arguing with people, arguing about Islam is a big, big problem, it's a big sin, um, all these things. Listen, the sins of the ear, listening to haram, listening to backbiting, listening to impermissible lyrics that talk about misogynistic things and so on and so forth. Sins of the ears, sins of the eyes, looking at haram, looking at pornography, looking at impermissible images, looking at um, that not lowering your gaze when you see something wrong. Um, these are sins of the eyes. Focusing always on the faults of Muslims is considered wrong. Sins of the hand include hurting somebody with your hand, stealing something, and there's more that come with the hand. The sins of the feet include walking to a place of haram or using your feet for something else, haram. So we have to examine which ones of these are we doing. And if we're not repenting for them or we're not stopping, why are we not stopping? That's the question to ask yourself. Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel that Allah won't punish you? Do you feel that it's not a big deal? Just because you're living around a bunch of people in a society which are immersed in sin and nothing is happening right now, don't think that's not a big deal. Look at what Allah says in the Quran of what will happen. Because Allah is Al-Halim. One of his names is Al-Halim. He's also patient. So Al-Halim is the one who's forbearing, meaning he gives people a lot of time to turn back. But then eventually, if they don't turn back, he seizes them. He doesn't, he doesn't give them any more time. So you have a certain amount of time to turn back to him, but then after that, it's over. And you have to make that call of reflect on the reality of the punishment of a certain sin and realize when you are in your grave all alone on a dark, stormy night being completely constricted and all of the creatures of the grave are coming out and trying to bite your hands and take you and take to eat off your skin, all the, the scary things that are going to happen in reality in the grave. And you only don't have, we don't have good deeds to turn to, we don't have our prayers to turn to, we don't have Fajr to turn to and Gohar and all the prayers and Quran to turn to and our fast. We don't have any of these things. We don't have a relationship with Allah. Instead, all we did was watch Netflix all the time and miss our prayers and we're lazy and we talked bad about people and we yelled at people and we got angry with people and we cursed at people and we scrolled on TikTok. All that. That's all we did. That's all we're going to have with us in the grave. And those things aren't going to benefit you because your family, your friends, your bank account, all of it's gone. And then the punishment is real. It kicks in and it doesn't stop. That's the one of the scary parts about the grave in the next life is these punishments, they don't stop for a long period of time. They don't stop. So we have to seriously realize that if we can't handle our hand getting near a coal, we can't handle, like if we touch the stove when it's hot, we can't handle that. How are we going to handle the fire of Jahannam, which is very, very hot and it's very serious. If we can't handle the extreme cold these days where I, in the US, there was a huge storm, unfortunately, which killed over 25, 30 people in certain parts of the East Coast huge snowstorm, just blizzards, things were frozen. If we can't handle going out in the freezing snow, there are parts of hell which are that are deathly cold, that, that hell has parts like caves which are so cold and are reserved for certain types of punishment and which are freezing and someone won't be able to handle it because someone is not going to be in a state where they have any warmth there. And then there's parts which are completely burning and just beyond boiling. So how are we going to do? That's the question we have to ask. If we can't do it in this life, if we can't turn to Allah in this life, what are we going to do in the next life? What are we going to do in the next life? Um, we are going to be obviously in trouble. So this category of person has to reflect on the punishment. And then you have to talk to your own self, your nafs, and tell yourself, I need to change. I need to change. I can't do this anymore. You must tell yourself that. You've got to tell yourself that. 
And once you change, and once you make an intention to change, and once you stop doing the sin, Allah will help you change. But you have to take the first step. You must take the first step, as Allah says in the Quran, that those who strive in our way, surely we shall guide them. And surely we shall guide them. So those are the uh, ways to remind yourself of lazy. And, and, then, and then lastly, that remind yourself of how much sin bogs you down in this life. It will bog you down in this life. When we're young, we don't realize it. We just, everyone wants to have fun, wants to have a good time, wants to feel light, wants to sleep all the time, so we want to do. But when we're older, the sins catch up to us. That I know categories of people. I know one, one person who is in their later stages of life, probably early 70s, late 60s, and they are, the, their whole life, um, there's categories of people, right? Not specific person, but they've been, they haven't been praying. They've been drinking. They, and, and at the end of, the, and a lot of other things, at the end of their life, the relationship is not very strong with family. The relationship is not strong with kids. They're just kind of alone. There's a very, very um, kind of depressive nature to their life. They don't have a very deep relationship with anybody anymore. And they're just kind of, and they're still caught up in drinking. And it's just not looking too good. And there's just, there's no, there's, there, there's no real purpose left for them. And someone else who's in the same age group, who's been trying to turn to Allah and striving to be close to Allah and the Prophet and that they follow the Sunnah of the Prophet they're happy all the time, they have a good family life, they're always going to Umrah and Medina, that's how they're spending their time. That they're sitting with their fellow Muslims and they're spreading goodness, they're doing dhikr, they're, te- they're, um, they're doing events and going to events, they're, 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 they're living a good life. Sins affect you in this life as well as in the next life. Muslims, we have to not only think about um, that we can't just put it off and say, oh, I'll, I'll deal with this later. We have to realize that there's effect in this life, that there is an effect in this life, and there's an effect in the next life. Um, so, then there's the categories of sins. So we'll do the categories of sins, and then we'll do questions, inshallah. You have different categories of sins. You have um, the first category, which is, a, which is just not doing what Allah has made obligatory on you. So we'll talk about what these sins are in a second. You then have the second category, which are sins between you and Allah. And you have the third category, which is sins between you and other people. The first category is you just, just disobeying Allah when it comes to the five pillars of the religion. So prayer, salah, fasting, Ramadan, not paying zakat, these types of things. I'm not going to have just to say I'm not going to ever go even bad in them. This, these are very serious sins because these are obligations. And the first question Allah is going to ask on the Day of Judgment is about our prayers. What did we do? Did, did we pray? And what did we do with our prayers? Um, and what did we do with our time? These are the types of questions Allah is going to ask us. And if we don't do well with those questions, it's obviously not going to be a good start to the Day of Judgment. So the first thing someone has to do is improve and rectify the haram that we have done when it comes to obligatory duties, when it comes to obligatory duties. So um, if we have missed prayers for a good portion of our life, if we have not fasted, if we have not paid zakat, number one, we have to start doing those things now. We must make a firm intention now to not be people who miss our prayers anymore. To not be people who miss our prayers anymore. We have to change, we have to change. Number two, we must make a firm intention to catch up and to start fasting if we don't fast properly, if we don't fast from above. And we have to pay zakat if we don't pay zakat. These are obligatory. They're very, very important. Many people, we might pray, but we ignore zakat. Allah says, وَأَقِيمُ salat وَأَتُوا zakat," And establish the prayer and pay zakat. So we have, to, we have to be firm in our prayers. We must get firm on all five prayers. We must get to the point where when we miss a prayer, we feel really, 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 really bad. We have to pray the five on time, in their time. We cannot be at the point anymore. If Dohar, for example, ends at 3 p.m. or we're praying Dohar at 2.59, we've got to start praying when it comes in. How, we, how many other things do we do for the dunya early? We show up to class, we make sure that we're doing well on our tests and so on and so forth, but what about, what about for Allah? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. So that is the first thing, is we have to catch up on the obligatory duties, the current ones. Then we have to make up for the past obligatory duties we've missed. So if we've missed prayers in the past, we must make those prayers up. 
if we have um, been missed fast in the past, we must make those fasts up. We must, if we have missed uh, paying zakat, we must catch up on zakat, and, and so on. So these are the types of things. There's a few questions here I'll answer. What is zakat? So zakat is, in, in Islam, it is something due to the poor every year. It's an amount of money that if someone earns above a certain amount of money, they're required to pay 2.5% of their standing wealth in charity to the poor at minimum every year. And if everybody was doing this properly, poverty would not be a problem at the way it is. Um, that, that is the way that the, Allah has set things up. So 2.5% uh, of the standing wealth that someone has, they have to pay in zakat. And, and this is from the time someone earns money and has this wealth, and it's also crossed into the stage where they're, uh, they're post-puberty, which again, of course, you usually would be if you start to earn money. Um, okay, there's another question here. Is it too late to pray after midnight? No, it's not too late. You can pray. Um, you should uh, ideally pray Isha earlier if you can, but if you need to pray after midnight or even pray any time up until Fajr, you, you can pray uh, Isha up until Fajr. But again, the, the best, better thing to do is, is earlier and to pray at midnight or anything like that is fine. So that's the first category of sins, the omitting obligatory duties. And I would recommend all of us get on a path where we start to make up our prayers from the past that we've missed. Maybe when, though we're required to pray from the time we hit puberty, if we were Muslim. If we converted, we don't have to pray from before we converted. But if we were Muslim, we must pray from the time we hit puberty up until the time we started to um, that, that start to properly pray. And there, what you do if you miss a lot of prayers is you calculate a number of prayers that you missed from the past, and you create a tracker and a schedule and you start to make those prayers up. And for some, um, I've reached out about this, but if you need, I have a spreadsheet I created to help you. Um, if you want it, you can email me at, um, uh, my email is in my bio, askabutah.gmail.com, and I can send you the spreadsheet to help you calculate your missed prayers. Um, same thing with missed fasts, you have to calculate. If you didn't fast for five years straight in Ramadan, and that's about 30 fasts per year times five, so 150 fasts. We have to start making those fasts up. Right? We can't just get. We can't just let these things go. We cannot let these things go. And then same thing if we miss zakat, we have to pay as zakat. Yeah. Is zakat based on lunar year? Yeah, it's based on lunar year. But I mean, roughly, as long as you're doing it once a year around the same time, I would recommend like every pick an Islamic month, every Ramadan or something, because that's already running on lunar, lunar year. The second category of sins is sins that you committed between you and Allah. These are sins. So we talked about the major sins, but this could be drinking, this could be sexual promiscuity, this could be consuming uh, interest in riba and, and other things. These are between you and Allah. What do I mean? That Allah knows you committed these and you have to repent to Allah for these. And then there's another group of sins which are between you and people, meaning you hurt people, you stole their money, you, 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 you hurt their feelings, and so on. For the sins between you and Allah, you have to leave those sins in order to get repentance, and then you have to feel remorse for them, leave them, and seek Allah's forgiveness and make the intention to never return to them. If you do that consistently, inshallah, then you, you and I will achieve forgiveness for that category of sins which are between us and Allah. But we need to make a list, and we need to buy each sin on that list, we need to work through until we work through all of them. We need to work through each sin on the list until we work through all of them. Because if we don't do that, we may die and we still have been committing major sins without knowing. Guys, this is not knowledge to take lightly. Many of us, we treat Islamic knowledge as this like extra thing that we'll do when we have time. But we spend all this time learning, you know, um, Shakespeare and uh, that reading all these other random books in school and, and all the good things are good to help your brain, of course. But you know, we learn geometry, we learn trigonometry, we learn algebra, we learn biology, we learn chemistry and physics, and all these things are good. But we don't spend any time learning our religion. We must learn our religion, and we must make sure we are not caught up in these sins. And if we've grown up in a life or a family environment in which these things are taken lightly, we must be the people who change. We must be the beacons of light to bring change to ourselves, to our homes, to our families, and to our community. Because not everybody takes this stuff seriously. And Allah may inspire you to take it seriously, and He may inspire you to be a means of um, giving goodness to others. So you have to take this seriously. Don't 
give up on this and, and, and at the same time don't take it like okay so question on missed prayers how do you make up missed prayers what if you missed hundreds even thousands so many of us have missed a lot of prayers you might have missed five years of prayers which, which equates to a few you know ten thousand or so it's a lot of prayers it's okay all you have to do okay number one number one you have to calculate how many you missed create a tracker and again you can email me i'll send you a spreadsheet and help you track it you create a tracker number two you create a schedule of how you're going to make those prayers up missed prayers do not have to be made up at any specific time meaning you can make up a missed fudger that you missed you can make it up at 10 p.m you can make it up at 1 a.m it doesn't matter what time you make it up you just have to make it up and so you work your way through them the second thing is and you say you set a schedule you create the tracker number two you set a schedule the third thing is you don't try to do it all in a short period of time if you miss many years of prayers you give yourself many years to make them up you just have to have the intention and you have to start you leave the finishing of that to allah when someone starts on the intention allah will facilitate that's what they will finish inshallah that's what they will finish that they will uh, finish the um, that they will finish the act that they set out to do or they will get the reward for finishing but you must start you must start you must start inshallah so just just that's the biggest thing is, is make up the missed prayers slowly, gradually. Don't overdo it. I would recommend if you could do an extra set of prayers each day with your current one. So if you do Fajr, do an extra Fajr, a, a missed Fajr. Do a, a missed Dohar with a Dohar, do a missed Asr with Asr, so on. That's it. All you have to do. If you don't want to do that, just do all your Fajrs in the beginning. So what do I mean by that? Um, that if you can do Fajr, then just pray, uh, let's say the whole day, you have some time, you can pray a few extra missed fudgers. Because fudger is easy, two rakat, two rakat, two rakat, two rakat, two rakat. So it's not difficult. The intention then for the missed prayer is just you do qada. Qada is the intention of um, the, uh, make up. Qada for, uh, qada for the prayer that you are making up. So qada for fajr. Okay, so hopefully that um, gives some clarity, inshallah. Okay. So questions here, any advice on praying on time? I struggle a lot to pray in the daytime, can't find Allah place. The biggest thing to praying on time is know that Allah made the entire masjid, the entire earth rather, a place of prayer for the Prophet Sallallahu and for the community of the Prophet So there's there's no worries about where you're going to pray. Just, just, just have a prayer mat with you, and as long as it's sufficient where you are, you can pray in a parking lot, you can pray in a mall, you can pray in a restaurant, you can pray in a park. You don't have the place does not have to be like. It just doesn't have to be visibly dirty. But if it's cl sufficiently clean, meaning you don't see um, clear filth there, you put your mat out and you pray. That's it, and don't make it a big deal. Just go make wudu and pray. It takes five minutes. You'll see your life will transform. Shaitan, he makes it into a big deal. He's like, oh, if you take time out to pray in the day, you're going to miss this thing, and then how are you going to do it, and you're not going to find a place, and just ignore all of that. Just start tomorrow. Pick one prayer. Go find a place to pray as you're going throughout your day. If you're in school, find a place in school. Um, if you have at work, they're required to give you a place to pray in most Western countries. It's the law. Um, you just have to tell them, I need a place to pray, and I'll give you a clean room. So simply... Just create a schedule for yourself and find a time to get it done. And you'll see things will change in shop. You'll see things will change. Okay. What if, what do we do if we miss the last and raising your stuff? So pray or shut up about it because hmm. Yeah, so 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 if Salah is missed out of laziness, you must pray. It's not Okay, laziness is one of the worst reasons to miss our salah. So you have to make it up. There's no excuse to not make up a salah out of laziness. The excuse may exist for someone who made up a salah, who didn't do it out of complete forgetfulness. But out of laziness, you must make the prayer up. This is the consensus of the four ulema, or of the four madhavs. How to pray with their with their is done in set three. Um, winter prayer is wajib in some of the schools and sunnah in others. You pray the winter by doing um, the fatiha, 
uh, you start making intention for the start of winter, and you do your Fatiha and your Surah, then you finish the rest of the prayer, and then Fatiha and Surah, and then you sit. Then in the third rakat, you stand up, you do Fatiha and a Surah, and you say Allahu Akbar, and you do what's called Dua'i Kanud. Dua'i Kanud has various um, narrations, um, uh, that, and, and you just have to do at least some Dua'i, you can look up Dua'i Kanud, or some Dua from the Quran, or some, some beneficial Dua, and you do that, inshallah, it will it will be um, sufficient for us after winter. So that's what's important for what you're praying, inshallah. Some schools have different, um, uh, some schools have different, um, they pray two and one, but do three. Okay, can we combine prayer? You cannot combine the prayer out of laziness. You cannot combine the prayer for no reason. Some of the schools permit combining when you are traveling, when you are en route to travel. But otherwise, traveling meaning you're going a distance of 55 miles, roughly, or 52 miles or more. Other than that, you should not, you can't just come, for example, if I'm just lazy today and I just want to combine the prayer, you can't combine. Some of the schools permit combining when it's heavily raining and you're praying in the masjid, they would permit, they permit combining Dohar and Asr at the Dohar time and Maghrib and Asr at the Maghrib time. But that's a very rare situation you combine, otherwise you can't just combine for no reason. But if you miss your prayer, if you miss your prayer, then um, you can combine it in the sense that, okay, you missed Maghrib, so you're about to pray Isha, you should pray Maghrib and then Isha, right? If you miss Dohar and you're about to pray Asr, you should pray Dohar um, uh, and, then, and then Asr. And the hadith that refer to the Prophet some combining the prayer, um, when, and, and they are by the four schools. They have not been accepted as um, a sound authority for you to then uh, invalidate the Quran, where Allah commands in the Quran to pray on time, or Allah commands in the Quran to pray, to pray on time. So it's important. This is actually very, very important when it comes to looking at solitary hadith, that without looking at the rulings of the madhab. The way of the tradition of Islam is you look at the rulings of a madhab. You do not go and look at hadith directly to learn rulings of fiqh. That is haram for the average Muslim to do. Until you learn 10 sciences, you first must master the Arabic language. Then you must master the science of the Quran. This includes a balagha and rhetoric. Then you must include uh, master uh, over 250,000 hadith. Then you must master tafsir. Then you must master usul al fiqh. Then you must master sarf and nahu. Then you must master usul al fiqh. Um, and, and then all the ancillary sciences associated with this, um, that mantiq and others, you must master. Now you can go and directly pull rulings directly from the, from the Quran. But otherwise, um, do not try and go to Sahih Bukhari, see a hadith, and be like, oh, this is the ruling of the religion. You don't know all the hadith, guys. You don't know the ruling of the hadith. So just, just, just stay away from that. You will confuse yourself. Focus your time on purifying your heart and becoming a better Muslim. Leave the rules of the religion to the scholars who have immersed their life in this tradition. It's like the example of a doctor who spends years, decades studying, mastering their science, math, their cart, their specialized pediatric cardiologists. They understand the way the heart, the chart of the, the heart of the child works. They understand the arteries and the blood flow in the vessel, and they understand all these things. And they've spent a long time mastering it. And then I come along, and I'm like, I do a little Google search, and I read one book on medicine, and I'm like, well, doctor, I read in this book that this is what you're supposed to do, and isn't that right? And the doctor's like, wait. Have you, like, you, you and I aren't even qualified to have that conversation with the doctor because we don't even have the degree. We don't even have a medical doctorate. So we can't, they're not even, we're not even at the same level. They, then they have to come down to my level and they have to tell me, well, no, that's not how it works. Then they try to tell me, but I'm like, but, but then I saw on WebMD that it said this. And they tell me, no, 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 that's not how it works. And they explain some, and then, and I keep going until the doctor's like, well, you're not, why are you wasting time here? Just let me focus on cardiology and you go focus on doing what you're trying to do. Same thing with engineering, same thing with any science or skill. It's only Islam where people have the audacity to try and pull without learning all the requisite sciences to pull rulings directly without going to the qualified scholars and to try and come up with those rules. So on that point, it's not permissible to combine the prayers for no reason whatsoever, according to the vast majority of the schools, certainly not in the Hanafi school, which is the school that I adhere to. Um, and at the same time, that focus on improving your character, focus on the things that are in the hands of the average Muslim for us to do. Don't focus on these um, peripheral rulings 
that one off may make sense and may make sense to apply, but if someone devotes a good amount of time to them, that would be something else. What if I can't take my break to pray? So nowadays I feel free to pray. So if you cannot take a break at work, you must speak to your manager or the person at work to pray. Guys, prayer is not something you can put below your work. The manager of the manager is Allah. The boss you must please is Allah. Your your job is not your boss. Your boss is Allah. Allah says, from a yajallahu Whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will give them a way out. Of every, excuse me, of every problem. Every problem will give them a way out. But it requires taqwa. Taqwa means you're obeying the command of Allah. So it's difficult. But you have to talk to your boss. You have to schedule the time in. You I would recommend. That right now, Dohar comes in around 12.15, Asr comes in around 3 p.m., and Maghrib comes in around 5. You have a five-minute break at each of those times where you go to pray, and you have a discussion in advance. And I can guarantee you if you had to do something physical, like use the restroom or drink water, you would have time to do that at work. So prayer is more important than all of those things for the most part. So we have to um, take that, uh, we have to take that um, seriously. Okay, do we have tips? Um, okay, so a couple other questions that are coming from there. So that's really what we're going to, for, for those, for the, with regards to the lesson of repentance, we'll do a recap shortly, but I think that's going to be most, uh, mostly it. Um, what if you understood the, just understood the fifth of prayers, you have to redo the prayers. So if you completely were doing the prayer wrong, um, you should work on redoing the prayer, but it's unlikely you were doing the prayer wrong. You may have just been making certain mistakes, Inshallah, in that case, your sunnah and nafal prayers on the Day of Judgment make up for the mistakes you made in the prayer. But it would depend on what level of a mistake you were making. For example, if somebody didn't make wudu ever before praying, yes, all those prayers would be invalid. Right? You just because you never made wudu. If someone never said Allahu Akbar, never did the, the takbir to ihram, those prayers would be invalid. If someone did not establish the arkan of the prayer, which is qiyam, standing, when the arkan of the prayer is standing, you must you must stand in your prayer. You can't pray sitting down for no reason when it's a hard prayer. That would be invalid. So there's certain things that depends on invalid. Okay, so the question about jealousy. So the way to cure jealousy, number one. Um, So the way to understand um, why someone experiences a strong state of jealousy. So the, this goes back to being content with the decree of Allah and what Allah is doing for his creation. What Allah is doing for his creation. When you are jealous or envious of someone, what you're actually doing subtly is telling Allah that he made a mistake. You're telling Allah that he made a mistake. Because Allah is the one who's giving them that thing and you are now jealous that they have that thing and you're questioning Allah, why did you give them that thing? So it goes back to a disease of the heart that has to be solved of being discontent with the decree of Allah. And this is done, number one, by spending time rectifying your relationship with Allah. Number two, spending more, make sure you're consistent on your five daily prayers. Then you need to make sure that you are consistent on doing extra dhikr every day, extra remembrance of Allah. The sunnah dhikr of the Prophet in the morning and in the evening. These are the types of dhikr that you must do regularly. And then you must spend time like reading about how to control anger both religiously and from other books, anger management type of books. Um, so this is uh, the way to, to, to approach uncontrollable anger. And you must, that until you immerse yourself in a lot more thicker, these spiritual diseases will exist in the heart for most people. They will exist in the heart for most people. Okay, so we're going to do a few more questions. We'll, uh,